Hi, so welcome to 2.5. It's rational functions. And um, we're going to have a quiz in class on this section. So we're actually doing a flip uh, lecture where we're not lecturing in class. We're going to watch the lecture at home. And then in class, we're going to do um, the problem. So I. Um, it will be open book. You can take notes now so that uh, you can use your notes during the quiz in class. I'm hoping it's going to be an easy high grade that you can boost up your grade. Um, and you can't talk to neighbors um, or any other friends in the class because that will result in cheating and a zero, but you can talk to me. So it will be a quiet class um, and you can call me for help at any time. So just make sure you're prepared. I can help you better if you come prepared to class. So just make sure you watch this video, take good notes, bring your graphing calculator, bring your um, textbook, and it should be a good, it should be a good class. I'm looking forward to it. So we're going to be talking about rational functions. Rational meaning ratio, okay? So rational functions are ratios of polynomials that can be expressed as f of x equals a of x over b of x, where a of x and b of x are polynomials, and by the way, b of x cannot equal zero because it's in the denominator. So let's look at these rational functions. They're pretty basic, um, and we want to look at them. It is helpful to memorize these graphs, but if you have a graphing calculator, that's a great resource, so if you forget anything, you can just take a look on your graphing calculator. Um, let's first look at f of x is 1 over x. So the domain of go away. Okay. The domain of 1 over x is going to be all real numbers except x cannot equal what's the denominator? A zero. Okay? We can't have x in the we can't have zero in the denominator. Okay, now let's look at the range. What's happening in the range? Well, it looks like this bottom graph is going really, really close to zero, but not touching it. It's going to infinity this way, right? So it's going down forever. And then if I look at this top part, it's going really, really, really close to zero, but never touching it. And it's going to go all the way, shoot up all the way to an, an infinity. So I said that it's going really, really close to zero, but never touching it, right? So the range is also y cannot equal zero, okay? Now let's look at the end behavior limits. Um, the end behavior limits is x goes to infinity and x goes to negative infinity. Okay, so I got negative infinity first. So as x goes to negative infinity, then f of x, the function, so as x is going to negative infinity, f of x is going really, really, really close to zero, but never touching it. So that means that the limit is going to be zero. And then the same thing on the, as x goes to infinity, positive infinity, it's going to go really, really close to zero, but it's never going to touch it. So we're going to say both those limits are zero. Okay. Now let's explore what's happening at x is going to zero, but we're going to be more specific. We're going to say as x goes to zero from the left, that's what that little negative exponent means, or as x goes to zero from the right, that's what that little positive exponent means. So as x goes to zero from the left, so here I'm coming from the left, and I'm going closer and closer to zero, so where am I heading? What's my height? My, I'm heading to negative infinity. So this is going to be negative infinity. And then if I go to zero from the right, so now I'm coming from the right, I'm heading towards zero, and my height is shooting up to infinity. So this limit is going to be positive infinity. All right, now let's look at g of x over here. g of x is 1 over x squared. Again, we cannot have um, x can't equal zero just because it's in the denominator. And the range is, if I look at this graph, do I have any points that are below the x-axis? 
No. So, and I'm never going to hit zero. There's no x value that I can put into g of x to give me a zero. Okay, I'm going to get really, really close to zero, but I'm never going to hit zero. So y is going to be greater than zero. Not equal to zero, just greater than. All right, let's look at the end behavior now. As x goes to negative infinity, as x goes to negative infinity, I'm going to go closer and closer to zero, but never hit it. All right, and then as x goes to positive infinity, I'm going to go closer and closer to zero, but never hit it. So this is also the limit zero. Now let's look at um, as x goes to zero from the left and to zero from the right. So as x goes to zero from the left, coming from the left right now, and I'm going to x equals zero, I'm getting closer to x equals zero, but I'm never touching it, and I'm shooting all the way up to infinity. So my height is infinity, so my limit is infinity. And then as x goes to zero from the right, so I'm going from the right, I'm going to x equals zero, I'm following this curve, I'm also going to infinity, positive infinity. So this limit is also infinity. So the, graph, the graphs approach a specific x and y values called asymptotes. So this is our new word that we're learning in 2.5, it's asymptotes. We can have vertical asymptotes and we can have horizontal asymptotes. So I actually have, um, let me show you the horizontal one. I've got a horizontal asymptote right here, okay, right at um, y equals zero. Let me make that uh, yellow, no, can't see it, I'll do green. I don't know. It's really hard to see it. Let's make it thicker. Okay. I've got a horizontal asymptote there. I've got another horizontal asymptote on the other graph. That's over here, right? Because it's getting closer and closer to zero, but never touching it. And then I've got a vertical asymptote on the first graph. That's here. Drawing it? What's happening? No, I'm just dragging my equal sign around. Oh my gosh. Okay, we're gonna not get so artistic because I'm not doing a good job. All right, so anyway, I'll show, I'll highlight it there. That'll be better. So I've got a vertical asymptote here and a vertical asymptote here, okay, at x equals zero. So these asymptotes are telling us what is the x and y values approaching, um, but never touching. All right, so let's go scroll down a little bit. So the line x equals c, so over here, c was 0, because x equals 0 is the y-axis, right? So x equals c, we call it c because it's a generic number, c, um, is a vertical asymptote. If the limit as x approaches c from the left of f of x is plus or minus infinity, or the limit as x approaches c from the right of f of x is plus or minus infinity, okay? Um, we also have the line y, y equals c, so before it was x equals c. This is a horizontal asymptote if the limit as x, so this is more end behavior kind of stuff. Um, if the limit as x goes to negative infinity of f of x is c, or the limit as x goes to positive infinity of f of x equals c. So um, sometimes all these words can get jumbled up. Don't, don't lose hope. Um, we are going to move on. All right, and let's move to example one. So we want to identify the asymptotes of g of x so I've got g of x written there, and then it wants you to graph it. So the first thing I'm going to do is look at g of x's parent function. So the parent function of g of x is 1 over x squared, because I see I've got this squared in my denominator. Um, so it's 1 over x squared. So if I look at what's happening, this minus 1 right here is telling me that I'm moving to the left one unit, right? 
Um, this 2 that's being multiplied by the parent function is telling me that I'm going to have a vertical stretch by a factor of 2. And then this plus 3 is going to tell me that I'm moving up 3 units. All right? So we're not forgetting chapter 1. If you um, are, you know, if you struggle with chapter 1, go back, review your test, ask me questions. Um, definitely want to make sure you understand chapter 1 because it's not going away. We're still going to be doing transformations and domains and all that fun stuff. So, um, so we know how the parent function is translated, and you also have your graphing calculator in this class at all times, so if you need to double check anything, you can graph this on your graphing calculator. All right, let's look at step two. If you know the graph of f of x, then, and we do, we know what um, f of x is one over x squared. We actually did it above here. It was this one, g of x, right? So this is 1 over x squared right here on the right, okay? Um, if you know the graph of f of x, which is the parent function, then you know g of x has vertical and horizontal asymptotes, just like f of x did. So just like we reviewed in the beginning. So um, before the vertical and horizontal asymptotes were at x equals 0, y equals 0. But now because we have a translation left 1 up 3, our vertical asymptote goes to x equals 1, our horizontal asymptote goes to y equals 3, so the asymptotes are translating just like our um, graph gets translated. All right, uh, let's look over here at the domain of g. So remember g of x is this function up here, okay? So let's look at the domain of g. Um, we can't have the denominator to equal 0, right? So if x is 1, then this denominator right here would be 0. We don't want that. So the domain of g is going to be x cannot equal 1. Um, and this actually confirms our vertical asymptote right here, x equals 1. So our asymptotes, remember, are lines that the graph will go closer and closer and closer to, but never touch that line. So if x equals 1 is our vertical asymptote, it's never going to touch. The graph is never going to touch there. And that makes sense because our domain confirms that the vertical asymptote x cannot equal 1. Okay? Um, you can also confirm your answers on your graphing calculator. Don't forget to use that. All right, so now let's look at the limits of g of x. If I take the limit as x goes to negative infinity of g of x, then that limit is going to be, so as x goes to negative infinity, let me highlight this for you. As x goes to negative infinity, then my limit will be 3. It's approaching that line y equals 3, but never touching it. All right? And then as x goes to positive infinity, so I'm going to go this way to positive infinity, what's happening to my height? I'm getting closer and closer to that horizontal asymptote, which is y equals 3, but I'm never touching it. So this limit is also 3. Now we're going to look as x goes to 1 from the left. So I'm coming from the left because of that negative exponent on 1, and I'm approaching 1. Never going to touch one, and I'm going to go shoot up high. So my limit will be infinity. And then as x goes to 1 from the right, let me trace this. So I'm coming from the right, and I'm going to 1, and I'm shooting up really high. So that's infinity again. All right? So when I have the negative and the positive in my exponents, those are one-sided limits, okay? So the one-sided limits um, help us just think about the domain, think about, um, you know, what's happening at that vertical asymptote, okay? And we do, yeah, we do it, the one-sided limits at, so, sorry, read this orange post-it. The one-sided limits are at the domain's excluded value. So the domain excludes 1, because x cannot equal 1 for the domain. So when we do our one-sided limits, 
we're doing is x goes to 1 from the left and then it's x goes to 1 from the right. Sorry, I didn't explain that too good at first. Okay. Um, by definition, we like to say, I kind of wrote it funny here, um, f of x equals a of x over b of x. So this is our rational expression. It has a polynomial in the numerator and a polynomial in the denominator. Okay. Now this is really important. We're going to refer to this a lot for the rest of this section. So vertical asymptotes, they are at any zero of b of x without matching a zero in a of x. Okay. Again, the words might not make sense right now, but when we do put it into practice, it will. And then the point discontinuity is where zeros of b of x has a matching zero in a of x. Okay, so let's let's apply this. Um, this is definitely going to be something you want to take notes on um, because we're going to be referring to it a lot. In example two, we want to identify the discontinuity of f of x. So we're going to use what we found out about discontinuities up here. Um, and you can see I've got matching factors in my numerator and denominator. So we're going to be comparing what, match, what has a match, what doesn't. Okay. First step is to simplify f of x. So if I simplify it, then I can cross out some terms. I can cross out x plus 3. I'm just left over here with 1 over x minus 2, um, and x cannot equal 3. So we crossed out all the x pluses 3, so we say x cannot equal 3. Um, because if I had x equals, is it x equals 3? Hold on. This is example 2. So it's 3 or negative 3? Now I'm getting, it should be negative 3 there. I have a typo there. It should be negative 3. Sorry x cannot equal negative 3. So if I put negative 3 here, then it will um, it'll make my denominator 0. Now 2 will also make it, but we still have a 2 there, so we're not going to talk about that just yet. So x cannot equal negative 3. Let me see if I can write that better. x cannot equal negative 3. All right. You guys know that's a negative 3? Okay. So, um, so we simplified f of x. We're going to identify the zeros of b of x and a of x. So b of x and a of x are actually going to be um, the numerator and denominator. b of x, if we look, is the denominator. Okay. So b of x is going to equal the denominator of f of x. And we're going to set it equal to 0, and we're going to solve for x. So we've got here x equals negative 3 and 2. Remember, 2 has a multiplicity of 2, because I've got two factors there with 2 in it. Okay? a of x is the numerator of f of x. So we're going to set that equal to 0 right here. a of x equals 0. And then we're going to solve that. We're also going to get negative 3 and 2, okay? But 2 has a multiplicity of 1 this time. Okay. Now remember our discontinuity rules above, right? I wrote this above. So this over here, we wrote this above, but it's going to come along with us for the ride because we're going to be referring to it a bunch. So a vertical asymptote is any zero of b of x without a matching zero in a of x. Well, remember, this b of x had um, negative 3 and 2, but the 2 had a multiplicity of 2. And this 2 just had a multiplicity of 1. So since I have an extra 2 in b of x, my vertical asymptote is at x equals 2. Okay, let's look at the point discontinuity. So this, for the vertical asymptote, one of the repeated zeros of 2 in b of x has no match in a of x. So that's how we come up with our vertical asymptote. Now, the 0 in negative 3 in b of x, sorry, the 0 negative 3 in b of x is matched by a 0 in a of x. 
So I have a point discontinuity at x equals negative 3 because remember, point discontinuity is where zeros of b of x has matching zeros in a of x. So 3 is in a of x and b of x, or negative 3, sorry, um, and the multiplicity also matches. All right? All right. Um, so now we, so we talked about vertical asymptotes, we've talked about point discontinuity, um, and now we're going to talk about the end behavior of a rational function. So the end behavior of a rational function in purple can be described by a horizontal, a slant, or a nonlinear asymptote, and it depends on the degree of a of x and b of x. All right, so um, I'm going to show you what these, this means, but first I want to de um, define what a proper rational function is and what an improper rational function is. So a pro proper rational function is when the numerator's degree is less than the denominator's degree. So the numerator degree is less than the denominator's degree. That's proper. All right, so for example, um, x over x squared plus 2. This would be proper because my numerator degree is 1 and my denominator's degree is 2. Okay, so this would be a proper rational function. Improper rational function is when the numerator's degree is the same or greater than the denominator's degree. So the numerator, maybe it's x squared. If it was the same, it would be x squared plus 2, right? That would be an example of an improper rational function. Um, so that's if it's the same, but let's think if it's greater, the numerator would be maybe x cubed over x squared my plus 2, something like that, okay? So these are examples of improper rational functions and then um, a proper. So it's important to distinguish that because now I want you to pause. I'm actually going to stop the video and make it a part two, but I want you to go in your book. Instead of me rewriting the chart on page 107, I want you to read the chart on page 107. Um, it is looking at a of x and b of x um, as the numerator and denominator of f of x. So we're talk still talking about rational functions. Um, and n is going to be the degree of a of x, while m will be the degree of b of x. And it's going to give you many different scenarios where n is less than m, n is equal to m, you'll have n equals m plus 1, and n is greater than m plus 1. So we're going to have lots of different scenarios um, by comparing the degrees of ax and bx. Um, and then you take a look at that chart on page 107 and look at how which scenarios create a horizontal asymptote, which scenarios create a slant asymptote. So that's a line that is not horizontal or vertical but slanted. And then sometimes we have a nonlinear asymptote um, where maybe the asymptote is a quadratic function. So maybe like a parabola or a hyperbola or something. So we've got different scenarios there, and um, we're going to be talking about them further. So pause this, um, go look, read page 107, the top of that, read that chart, look at the different comparisons. We'll be practicing that when we come back to part two.